friends, it's a great joy for me to connect with you this day and talk to you about the Lord's Prayer. If you look at Matthew's Gospel 6 chapter and read from 7 to 13, there Jesus said, When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their much speaking. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before he asks. So after this manner you pray. Then the Lord said, Our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive other debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Dear friends, when Jesus spoke to the disciples about prayer, he taught them how to pray. He said, be not like the heathen, the unbelievers. Pray not like them. Use not vain repetitions. So when we understand prayer, we must know that God the Father knows everything that we need. We are to pray in the pattern that Jesus has taught these dear disciples. And the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus spoke to them and taught them to pray after this manner. Now, many years ago when I was young, I was visiting a home in Munar in Kerala. And I want to talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. An old couple was there and he spoke to them about Jesus and prayed over them. After the prayer, they began to recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, they began to say. And there's nothing wrong in it. The Lord's Prayer can be recited within 20 seconds. After it is over, they said, Abba, Mudinjide. It's over. Now, that is not right when we think about the Lord's Prayer. We can recite it in 20 seconds, but when you look at it in a deeper way, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we have to understand that it deals with a lot of things, dealing with time and eternity, all that we have to have in this world, all that we are going to have in eternity, all can be understood through this one prayer. I want to place before you the dynamics of the Lord's Prayer. Point number one, the Lord said, Our Father who is in heaven. You know, when we come to God the Father, how can we call God Father? The angels in heaven will not be able to call God Father. They would not be able to sit before God. Only the begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, can call God Abba Father. Now, when a sinner goes to Christ, goes to God, he or she can pray, God be merciful unto me a sinner. When a sinner repents for his and her own sins and come to the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus gives them salvation. And the Holy Spirit can give them the spirit of adoption, making them to call unto God, Abba, Father. Then only we can call God, Father. So, if this prayer has to be recited by people, they must be born again. A sinner cannot recite this prayer. A sinner cannot understand this prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven. When we talk about the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is the begotten Son of God. For begotten son, that is for Jesus Christ, there's a particular word in Greek, it is called huyos. Huyos means it is a special word exclusively meant for the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we talk about we as children of God, there is another word used, it is technon, that is a general term. So when we go to God, we are going to him with the spirit of adoption, calling God Abba Father. We can call God Abba Father. Unless we are saved by the blood of Jesus, unless we become the children of God, we have no right to call God Abba Father. So we must understand that when we approach this prayer, we must know that we must be born again. And then we can call God Abba Father. You know, sometimes I come across people who call God Daddy in a very light manner. I would not dare to call God in that manner. We are to approach God with reverence. We can never become over familiar with the Lord Jesus Christ, nor with God. So when we address God the Father, our Father who art in heaven, we must understand these points in a deeper way. The second point is, hallowed be your name. We are called by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given to us his own adoptive spirit. So when we approach God, we must be careful to use the name of Jesus, name of God, in a very careful manner. We can never flippantly use the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I come across people, if they drop a tumbler and it breaks, they say, Oh Jesus, we should never do that. When we talk about God, when we come to God, we should never misuse the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A man was standing on a street corner 
and a young man came and tried to pick his pocket. So he held his hand and when he looked at him, he saw it was a very handsome young man. He said, why are you stealing? And he said, I don't have any job. So this gentleman brought him to his own office and said, I'll give you a job. I'll give a recommendation letter. I'll send you to my friend who will give you a good job, but I'm giving you my name. Keep my name unsullied. Keep my name without destroying it. After 15 years, when this old gentleman was in his office, there came a family to meet him. When they came in, he could not really understand who they were. A man and his wife and two children were there. And this young man told this gentleman, Sir, 15 years ago, you gave me your name. I have kept it unsullied. We are given a name as we are Christians. The name of Jesus is mentioned on us. Are we keeping the name of Jesus unsullied? If we are defiling the name of Jesus, if we are discrediting the name of Jesus, we cannot pray the prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The third point is your kingdom come. When Jesus Christ came into this world, the whole world was in the sway of the evil one. When he began to preach God's word, the time is fulfilled, kingdom of God is at hand. The Lord Jesus Christ ushered in the kingdom of God into this world. Kingdom is basilia in Greek. It speaks of a dominion rule of God's kingdom. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. You know, when Jesus Christ comes into your heart, his rule comes in. That is one area, that is one connotation of the kingdom of God. The rule of God is in our hearts. Later, when the church is established, when believers gather together and form the church, the kingdom of God, the rule of God is there. Then it speaks about the thousand years reign in which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come into this world. He's going to reign all over the whole world. It also speaks about the eternal kingdom. You know, when we say, let your kingdom come, the Greek tense is, it is an imperative tense. It is a command. When we pray, your kingdom come, as children of God, we are ushering in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are ushering in the presence of God, ushering in the kingdom of God, at least in our own area of ministry, at least in our own area of work. We must be able to promulgate this promise that God has given to us. St. Paul understood this dictum. He understood the power of this word. He says, now thanks be to God who causes us to triumph everywhere always making manifest the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. This aroma of the Lord Jesus Christ. So wherever we go, anywhere, always, every time, we have to bring in this power of the Holy Spirit. Let your kingdom come. The fourth point is, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Dear friends, God has prepared everything for this world. God has prepared everything for his children, we. And as we approach God, every day we must be able to know God's will and do his will in this world. When we talk about God's will, I can tell you four points in general will of God. The first point is salvation. It is God's will that all should be saved. So salvation is God's will. The second is sanctification. It is God's will that we must be able to flee from fornication and become sanctified. The third point is, it is God's will that we must praise God in everything, every time. The meaning is, we must have a positive attitude of thanking God and praising God. The fourth point is, we must be able to do good, to put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. When we talk about the will of God, four points are there. Salvation, sanctification, doing good, and praising God in everything. When we are able to have this four general will of God, then we would be in a position to understand and choose God's will in specific area. I would rather suggest that we must be able to do God's will in two areas, choosing our life partner and also doing God's work. You know, God has his own agenda for everybody. Unless God calls a person for full-time ministry, nobody should venture into that area. I'm so happy to note that I have done God's will in these two areas, specific areas, my marriage and also doing God's work. When I had worldly opportunities, God called me for his service and I've been in the ministry all these 48 years. The fifth point that I want to place before you is, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't speak only about the food that we need daily. Daily, for daily, that particular word, the Greek word is epiousias, and bread is artan. 
Epiusias artan means the deeper meaning is it is a very unusual word that is found only in the Lord's prayer. The meaning of the word is daily food is not daily food just to for that particular day. It speaks about food for today, speaks about food for tomorrow, it speaks about food for eternity. What I like to tell you is the food that we eat daily that gives us strength for tomorrow. So when we come to God, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When we come to God, when we read God's word, we eat the word of God. St. Paul says, let the word of God dwell in your hearts and all wisdom. So when we read God's word, we must understand that it has inherent power, inherent power. Now then my question is, we Christians, when we come to God, are we really longing for the word of God? Jesus never said, read the Bible. He said, search the scriptures. St. Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, he says, search the scriptures, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. The more we imbibe God's word, the more stronger we would be. Jesus said, if a person loves me, he'll keep my commandments. My father will love him. We will come and make our abode with him. So when we approach the daily bread that God has for us, we must understand the word of God is very important. Study the word of God, learn the word of God, memorize the word of God, and God's word shall dwell in our hearts continuously. We must understand that God created the whole world by the power of his word, and every atom, every molecule, every organ, everything in this world is held by the word of God. So when we approach God's word, when we eat the word of God, it becomes a part of our own personality. There was a man who was uh, a lover of God's word, but he was working in a company of explosives and there was an explosion and he lost both his hands and the explosion also hit his face. He was hospitalized. Later he came to know that he lost his eyesight. He was so sad because he was not in a position to read God's word. He came to know about a person who has lost both hands as well as eyes, was able to read God's word, the Braille Bible, using the lips. So he brought the Braille Bible, he began to run his lips over the, over the characters in the Braille Bible, and to his own horror he found out that the, his lips have lost its sensitivity. Then he said, I'm not able to read God's word. He wanted to kiss the Bible goodbye. And as he was pressing the Bible against his own lips, what happened was his tongue came out and he was able to feel that the tongue was able to feel the, the characters there. Believe it or not, he was able to run his tongue over the whole Bible seven times and read God's word. God has given to us all opportunities to read God's word. Are we longing to read God's word? Jesus says that his bread is enough for us. Give us this day our daily bread. Every day we have the opportunity to read God's word and obey God's word. The sixth point is, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When we talk about forgiveness of sins, only God can forgive sins. Only Jesus can forgive sins. Holy Spirit enhances the forgiveness of sins when people repent. We have no right to forgive others sins. What Jesus implies here is forgive others. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Dear friends, I want to tell you that when we interact with other people, often we get into problems. Others insult us. Some people are not able to forgive others. We are not supposed to forgive others since only God can forgive. What we have to do is we have to forgive others. How can we do that? Often people say, well, I did not do much. The person has insulted me. We have to look at situations, look at people only through God. We are also full of problems. We are not perfect. So what is wrong in accepting the other person who has harmed us? We must be able to accept others and forgive people not, may not be able to forgive sins because we cannot forgive sins. We may accept people and understand them, love them and forgive them. But they may have to answer God for the wrong that they have done. So when we pray, forgive our debts as we forgive others, we must know that we must be in a position to forgive others. I've come across many people who keep grudge against others. This person spoke like this, that person spoke like this. How can they do like that? When they go on repeating the same thing in their minds and also tell others, they wound them again and again. God will not be able to forgive you if you're not able to forgive others. So when we pray this prayer, we must understand these are the implications that are there in this particular word. 
Seventh point that I want to place before you is, lead us not into temptation. It doesn't mean that the Lord is dragging us towards temptation and we are pleading, oh God, don't lead us into temptation. It is not what God meant. Lead us not into temptation means don't allow us to enter into temptation. When we talk about temptation, God will not be tempted with evil. Jesus who knew no sin, did no sin, had no sin, was tempted like all of us. But he never committed sin. He was able to overcome sin. Bible never says temptation will not come to a believer. Temptation will be there. But when we talk about temptation, there are three points there. Tempting, yielding, sinning. It comes to everybody. Jesus was tempted. We are tempted. Everyone would be tempted. What we have to understand is we have to pray sufficiently lest we fall into temptation. When the temptation comes, we must be in a position to get the grace of God and not yield to the temptation. So we must be careful when we understand about temptation. Some people blame the devil. Oh, I'm tempted by the devil. It is his duty. But what is our duty? When we pray sufficiently, we will be able to overcome temptation. Prayer is very important. The word of God says, watch and pray. Watch in prayer. Pray and watch. Watch and pray. Watch in prayer and pray and watch. Why people fall into sin? Even after salvation, even after coming close to the Lord Jesus Christ, they fall into sin. Why? Sin is sweet. I would say that sin is always sweet. And sexual sins are more sweeter. Why people fall into sin? They do not understand that behind this sinfulness, behind the sweetness of sin, there is death. The word of God says some people keep the sin because it is sweet in their own mouth. They go on munching it. It is very sweet, but once it goes into the system, it becomes the, the poison of asps, poison of adders, poison of snakes. We must be very careful to understand the effect of sin upon a person. We must understand that we can overcome the temptation. Jesus said, the world will have problems for you. The world will bring problems for you. I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So when Jesus is in us, when the Holy Spirit is in us, we will be in a position to overcome every evil that comes along. The eighth point that I want to place before you is deliver us from evil. Some people, when they get into problem, when they get into evil, they say God created evil. God allowed this to come. God is good. God never created evil. The question can be, how did evil come into this world? Lucifer chose to be away from God. God is good. God is always good. When he chose to be away from God, evil came. Evil is nothingness. Evil is not an entity. It is not a personality. It is nothingness. Augustine said that evil is privatio boni. That is no good in it. So God never created evil. Evil is parasite. There is no personality there. So when people who should be with God, when they ought to be away from God, they enter into darkness, it is nothingness, there is no good in it. Evil is the absence of good. We must understand that. So when people enter into evil, they should never blame God. Karl Barth, a great theologian, he speaks about evil as nothingness. Another man of God, another theologian named James E. Loder, he said, he quotes Ecclesiastes where Solomon says, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So evil is vain, vain things. When we look at this world, there are many things that are around us in this world. Lust of the eyes, lust of flesh, pride of love. They are from the evil one. So these things are brought from the evil one, not from God. And when a person follows these things, they get into a problem. And there is another man of God whose name was Scott Peck. And he says that evil in humans is contagious. It is narcissism. It is controlling others. So evil was not created by God. When people move away from God, they open their hearts to enter into the dark domain. So we must understand that evil always hides behind lies. You know, people speak lies and say, everything is all right. No. When people who are expected to live in the truth, we have to receive the truth live for the truth, live in the truth. When they move away from God, they enter into darkness. Even speaking one lie in our life will bring darkness into our own lives. So if we have to pray, Lord, deliver us from evil, we must not keep the door open for the evil to come into our own life. 
we must be in a position to say, Lord, deliver us from evil. The Lord is able to deliver us totally from evil. The ninth point that I want to place before you is, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. How can God deliver us from evil? Because God is the kingdom and he has the power and the glory forever and ever. So when we become the children of God, we must understand that God has got everything ready for us. Not only should we recite this prayer, but we must be able to live this prayer. I would rather say that this prayer covers our whole personality, our life, our family, our ministry, our life in this whole world is held by this prayer. When we understand this prayer, it's not simply telling this prayer, it is living this prayer. My encouragement to you all would be that we must be able to understand this great blessing in this prayer. And after this prayer, Amen. You know, the Amen was a word that was used by the Jewish culture, the Jewish people in their synagogues after they give a discourse or after they speak about God, then everyone says Amen. When they say Amen, it means I am falling in line with what I have heard. I am part of it. Now, many people say Amen without understanding the meaning of it. Here, after the Lord's Prayer, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And then we say, Amen. When we love the Lord with all our hearts, we will be able to enjoy these great blessings. Years ago, there was a young man in Russia. His name was Sergei Kordeko. He was a persecutor. He was a young man. And he was instrumental in persecuting 150 churches. He used to go and in churches, destroy people, beat people, take all the literature, Bible and other things and burn them. One day this Sergei Kordeko was burning the papers, burning, burning the Bibles and all. He came across a single piece of paper. In that paper, a small child has written the Lord's Prayer. This man who was a persecutor, he had been persecuting 150 churches. And then when he read that, there is a warmth in his heart. And then he was able to understand that it is Jesus who touched him. His life was changed. He stood for the truth. He defected into Canada and then he died for the Lord. He was, he was 21 years old when he died for the Lord. The Lord's Prayer has that deep blessing. Mm -hmm.